Welcome to worship. We're going to start in Psalm 90. This is Moses' psalm, and here's what he says. The Lord, you've been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born, where you gave birth to the earth, before COVID-19, before quarantine, before shelter in place. There's some editorial liberties here, but he goes, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You've been our dwelling place. You've been our shelter. You've been where we've been sheltered all along. It's a little tricky for us to do worship. We're not all in a big room. We're spread out around hundreds and even thousands of different rooms, but we are united in one spirit, as one body, in one faith, one family. And we're all together in this interim time where the old is still very fresh and the next is not quite yet. We're in the liminal, transitional, in-between time. And there's a late uh, Celtic father who wrote a blessing about that. I want to read this for us as a call to worship. This is called For Interim Time. When near the end of day, life has drained out of light, and it's too soon for the mind of night to have darkened things. No place looks like itself. Loss of outline makes everything look strangely in between, unsure of what has been or what might come. In this wan light, even trees seem groundless. In a while, it will be night, but nothing here seems to believe the relief of darkness. You are in this time of the interim, where everything seems withheld. The path you took to get here has washed out. The way forward is still concealed from you. The old is not old enough to have died away. The new is still too young to be born. You cannot lay claim to anything in this place of dusk. Your eyes are blurred, there's no mirror. Everyone else has lost sight of your heart and you can see nowhere to put your trust. You know, you have to make your own way through. As far as you can, hold your confidence. Do not allow confusion to squander this call, which is loosening your roots in false ground, that you might come free from all you have outgrown. What is being transfigured here is your mind, and it is difficult and slow to become new. The more faithfully you can endure here, the more refined your heart will become for your arrival in the new dawn. I don't have better words than those words to address the time that we're all in. It's a call to stay confident in what's not shaken, to remember what's strong even when we are weak. And there's a prayer that Christians all around the world are praying this Sunday during Lent. And we'll pray this together. A few more lines and the bolded lines right there watching on your screen. I would encourage you to actually say together with me out loud. All right, so I'll start us, and then when you see it bold, that's for us to all say together. Almighty God, you alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. Grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise. That among the swift and varied changes of the world, our hearts may surely be fixed where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You are close, you are constant in every season. When we are broken, you are the healing Lord, the healing strength you are present in every weakness when we are barren you are the overflow the overflow our god is strong
our God is faithful through every storm. This is our song, that our God is strong. Yes, Lord, we're comforted by the words of Psalm 46. Say, our God is our refuge and strength. You're an ever-present help in time of trouble. And so, Father, even in these days, even in these days where it feels like we are, we are in times of trouble, let our hearts be comforted by the fact that you are our strength. We don't have to muster that ourselves. You are our strength, and you are ever-present. <laughs> You're walking with us in all of it, Lord. None of it surprises you. We know you're working in all of it in some mysterious way that we cannot understand, God. But we look to you. We look to you as our strength. We look to you as our refuge. We look to you as our fortress. God, help us to walk these days with courage, with boldness, without fear, knowing that we are yours. Amen. Thank you, Lauren. Thanks, guys. It's good to not see you. Uh, everybody up here is trying to keep our distance on stage. But we're grateful that you're worshiping with us online. If you have your Bible, go ahead and open it to the book of Acts, chapter 28. And while you do... If you're worshiping with kids at home, I have a question. Does church on your TV or on your device, does that count against the screen time allowance for the day? I know a lot of families limit kids to a certain number of hours on the screen, but, but does this count against that? Because if it does, that could really affect our online attendance, I think. With that in mind, after two Sundays of worshiping online and talking to many of you who've interacted with us through these online gatherings, we have decided to shift the amount of screen time of our gathering just a bit. Rather than aiming for about an hour and 15 minutes, we're going to aim for about 45 minutes today to leave you a little more time in your living rooms or wherever you might be to interact with each other, interact with the sermon, pray with each other. And if you happen to be watching alone, you can interact by chat on our various online hosting places, Facebook Live or the live stream from our website. And many of you, if you want to interact with us after the service, you can join in with our Grace Zoom communities at 9.45 and then also at 11.30. And you should have the link to that Zoom gathering in your email if you've been getting our daily emails. If you don't have the link, you can message one of our online gathering hosts and they will get that information to you. And those times of gathering have been really meaningful. When we sign in, we get a chance to see each other, and then we break out into smaller groups or five or six and process some of the questions, how we're doing, how we're feeling, how we're handling this unprecedented time in our nation and really in the world. Now, um, I am preaching a little shorter today, so if you are just craving a big, long sermon from me, uh, there are a lot of those, like pretty much every one on the webpage. And so if you go to our Grace Neville website, click on the resources, and you can find all those sermon series. And if you're looking for more worship, we have lots of resources available. You can find the Grace Neville YouTube channel, or our team has also put together a playlist on Spotify. If you listen to Spotify, the COVID-19 Grace Neville worship playlist can help uh, connect you as well. But as a community here in Georgia, we are coming to the end of the first two weeks of widespread quarantining and digital learning days. And we, if you're living in Gwinnett, are just learning that we are uh, ordered to stay at home for all non-essential activities. And all of this is in an effort to reduce the spread of this virus, COVID-19. 
And it's not very clear when the end of these restrictions will be. So let's do that one word game again. In your living rooms or wherever you're watching, think of one word that you would use to describe your experience the last two weeks. Staying at home. Now, share that word with someone that you're with or go ahead and put it into the online chat window if you can. Cloistered, cooped up, stir crazy, afraid, concerned, anxious, stretched, well rested, exasperated, zoomed. I don't even know if that's a participle these days, but a lot of people are on Zoom. Now, there's another option that comes from the final word of the book of Acts. And in Greek, it's akalutas. And it translates to without barriers or obstacles, or it could mean freely or unhindered. Now, that word might not seem to be a very good fit for our situation when so many of us are at home in what feels like mandated confinement. But in addition to that, it doesn't seem like that word fits very well where Luke uses it at the end of the entire book of Acts. Now, in Acts 28, we're coming to the end of Paul's story, and two weeks ago here we talked about how that conclusion to the story involved the sea voyage where they get caught in this storm and they're blown way off course and Paul's a prisoner but after two weeks of no bearings and no hope of landing Paul has the word of the Lord and so he becomes the gathering point for an unexpected community where he can share his faith and then last week when they finally shipwreck and wash ashore on the little island of Malta you might remember Paul joins in the efforts of some of the islanders to build a bonfire, just trying to serve his cold and clammy crewmen. And while he is picking up some sticks, a viper latches onto his arm, and all the people on Malta, the islanders, expect Paul to swell up and die. But Paul shakes off the serpent into the fire, demonstrating uncommon calm. And as we'll see here in a moment, Paul's uncommon calm and the miraculous healing from that venom actually opens the door for some amazing miracles. This is Acts 28, verse 6. The people on Malta expected him to swell up or suddenly fall dead, but after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to Paul, they changed their minds and said he was a god. Now, there was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius, the chief official of the island, and he welcomed us to his home and showed us generous hospitality for three days. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Now, the Greek there for fever is coviticus and dysentery, coronicus. The hard thing about doing this in an empty room, I have no idea if you're laughing right now. The Greek is not really coviticus and coronicus. That's a joke. But the father was sick, and Paul went in to see him, and after prayer, placed his hands on him and healed him. And when this had happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. They honored us in many ways, and when we were ready to sail, they furnished us with the supplies we needed. Now, they're there on Malta for three months. Finally, they catch a ship when the seasons change, and they get all the way to Italy, a little town on the coast called Patioloi. And there, verse 14, we continue, there we found some brothers and sisters who invited us to spend a week with them, and so we came to Rome. Now, this is the end of the journey that began all the way back in Acts 19. And this journey, this end in Rome, is going to fulfill the promise that Jesus made about Paul back in Acts chapter 9 when Paul comes to trust Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And Jesus promises that Paul will share his good news, the good news of Jesus, with Jews and Gentiles and even with kings. And so now Paul is in the city of the world's greatest king at that time, at least in earthly terms, Caesar. We get to verse 15. 
the brothers and the sisters there had heard that we were coming. And they traveled as far as the forum of Appius and the three taverns to meet us. And at the sight of these people, Paul thanked God and was encouraged. When we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. And three days later, he called together the local Jewish leaders. When they had assembled, Paul said to them, my brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. And the Jews objected, so I was compelled to make an appeal to Caesar. I certainly did not intend to bring any charge against my own people. And for this reason, I have asked to see you and talk with you. It is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. Now, after this encounter there in Rome, a larger crowd of the Jewish community returns to Paul's home, where Paul preaches about the kingdom of God and tries to persuade them about Jesus. The text tells us some were convinced, but others wouldn't believe. And the reason that some reject Paul's message is because Paul emphasizes God's love is for all people, not just Jews, but Jews and Gentiles. Well, after that conversation, we find the final two uh, verses of the book of Acts. It says, for two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. And he proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. There's that word. Akolutas. All boldness and without hindrance. Now, this word doesn't really seem to fit here. Paul is under house arrest. There's a soldier guarding him. Paul mentions he's got this chain. He says he can't leave. And in addition, he's waiting for his trial date where he'll stand before Caesar, plead his case, and wait for a verdict that could mean the difference between life and death. I don't know about you, but that seems pretty hindered. Not unhindered. I mean, it seems like two huge hindrances, two big problems for Paul. He's confined to his house, and he's an uncertain future. He's limited in movement, and he's impossible to predict how things will turn out. I don't know if this sounds familiar. But there's more. This is not just a strange word for Paul's situation, unhindered. It's also a strange word to end this whole book of Acts. I mean, what happens to Paul? What happens at the trial? We don't find out. I'm just guessing that some of you, as you've been home these last couple of weeks, have watched a few movies. And... Our favorite movies, our most popular movies, they tend to tie up the loose ends of their favorite characters, of the key characters. Nemo is reunited with Marlon. Elsa and Anna are reconciled at the end of Frozen. Simba And his friends reclaim Pride Rock after Scar is defeated. The Lord of the Rings and the Return of the King. Well, that actually has so many plot lines that they had to end it like four times in order to wrap up all of the loose ends. But in the book of Acts, this is our ending. A house arrest and a trial date? What's this about? How does Paul just end the story and say it's full of boldness and unhindered? I mean, I am looking for the sequel when I finish the book of Acts. And of course, there's a very real possibility that we are the sequel. But the question remains, akalutos, unhindered. Really? That's your one word at the end of Acts? How? Given the circumstances, how? And there are two keys in the text that we read together. The first is in verse 20. Paul says it's because of the hope of Israel that he is in chains. 
And then back in verses 14 and 15, we find that Paul, in his journey to Rome, is greatly encouraged and thanking God because of the brothers and the sisters, the followers of Jesus, who were already there in Italy. So let's look at this first one, the hope of Israel. This is the reason throughout this multi-chapter story of Paul's ongoing trial and journey to Rome, this is the reason he keeps giving for his detainment. He says, I am arrested because I believe in the hope of Israel. It's what he tells the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders in Jerusalem. It's what he tells Felix, the governor in Caesarea in Acts 24. He has to wait a couple of years. This is what he tells King Agrippa. And when he speaks about the hope of Israel, specifically, he's talking about the resurrection from the dead. And Paul says, the reason that my Jewish people have such a problem with me is that I believe wholeheartedly in the resurrection of the dead. And for Paul, the resurrection from the dead is inextricably connected. In fact, you could even say proven and promised by the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul in Jerusalem knew about when Jesus was crucified. But then, you might remember, Jesus appeared to him when he was a great enemy of the church and spoke to him and was tangibly alive to Paul on that road to Damascus. And it changed everything for Paul. Because suddenly, Paul realized that all the promises about God resurrecting people after he's dealt with all judgment and evil... All those promises are now proven and demonstrated and promised in reality of Jesus. So for Paul, this whole trial comes back to Jesus and Paul's confidence that Jesus is indeed the source of indestructible life. And Paul, this whole time, is daring to believe in and proclaim a God who will resurrect the dead. And he is certain of this promise because of his experience with Jesus. And this is partly why Luke, at the end of the book of Acts, can say that this whole kingdom of God, the rule and reign of God, the power of God, the promises of God, this is why Luke can say they are without hindrance because even death cannot stop the advancement of God's purposes in the world. And if even death can't stop it, what are some chains going to do? What's a house arrest going to do? If death can't stop it, what's a shipwreck going to do? What's a serpent's bite going to do? What's a fever or dysentery going to do to put God's purposes off track? And the answer is nothing. And friends, in this strange time, if you have the hope of Israel, the confidence and the promise of the resurrection of the dead, through Jesus' own life, death, and resurrection, if you have the hope of Israel, then you can be stuck, you can get sick, you can feel like you're in chains, you can even be in chains But if you know the hope of Israel, you are indestructible, unshakable, indomitable, unassailable, unbeatable, without hindrance, just like Paul here in spite of his circumstances. And here's the amazing thing. When you know the hope of Israel, you become the Israel of hope. Now, Israel, in this whole story, of course, refers to God's chosen people. But here, in this story, as we mentioned, Paul is telling his fellow Jewish people that actually the promises of Israel are, because of Jesus, extended now toward the Gentiles. Or like Paul would say it elsewhere, the Gentiles are being grafted in to the promises that God made to Israel. And so, this Hope and encouragement 
that Paul experiences when he sees some other brothers and sisters in Italy. This is the hope of encountering God's people. When you know the hope of Israel, you become the Israel of hope, the people who bear encouragement, the people who live with hope in a challenging world. And if you look at the book of Acts from a wider angle, you begin to notice that there are innumerable unnamed disciples. You think about 3,000 who came to faith on Pentecost in Jerusalem when the Holy Spirit is given. A couple chapters later, there's a miracle at the temple. Another 2,000 come to faith. And then throughout the book of Acts, Luke provides periodic progress reports from Syria and then from Asia Minor and from Ephesus and Corinth telling us in, in Athens about people who are coming to faith. But they don't have names. We don't hear their stories. Luke is following Peter and then Paul through the book of Acts, but, but there's all these other people who are starting to follow Jesus and starting to do amazing things. And what we realize is that this story in Acts, it does focus on Peter, it does focus on Paul and a few other key characters, but really the focus is not on those two prominent ministers of the word, Peter and Paul. The focus is on the ministry of the word. It's not about the name of the leader or the organization. This book of Acts is about the name of of our leader, our king. It's about Jesus. His name is the most important name by far. And his kingdom, his rule, is the crucial issue. And so by the time Paul finally gets to Italy, Paul feels like he's pioneering, but when he lands, there are already followers of Jesus there. The movement has grown beyond the apostles' own travels. And when we begin to understand this, that every single one of us has a story, every single one of us has a role to play, that even though sometimes it seems like the scriptures focus on one or two or three key leaders or on specific sort of gathering points, Really, every person has a story from God. Every person has a role to play. When you know the hope of Israel, you become the Israel of hope. Now, there's an illustration of this sort of thing, looking at these brothers and sisters. And we've used it here before, but it compares two different ways of traveling. And of course, this illustration may not be the best illustration when we can't travel outside of really our own yards. But in any case... In a book called Exponential Organizations, they write about the difference between Hyatt, the esteemed hotel chain, and then Airbnb, which if you're not familiar with Airbnb, there's all sorts of interesting places that you can stay all around the world through Airbnb. But the comparison goes like this. Hyatt is one of the most recognized hotel chains in the world. Whenever they build a new hotel, they have to hire new property people to maintain it. They have to buy land. They have to hire cleaning staff. They have to get cooking staff. They have to get admin staff. There's a whole promotional media marketing package. I mean, there's just a huge amount of expense and investment up front simply to get a Hyatt or one of their hotels. Airbnb, however... It makes it quite simple for anyone to be able to open their home upstairs. Some people even have like an Airstream trailer in their yard. But, you know, it's not Hyatt quality accommodations. But the point is the Airbnb makes it very simple for people to open their homes, provide hospitality, and use what they have. Now, here's the comparison. Hyatt started in 1957. Currently, it has about 680 properties worldwide across 54 countries. That's an impressive footprint. Airbnb, however, started in 2009 and currently has more than a million listings in 34,000 cities across 190 countries. Airbnb is everywhere. Now, Hyatt is a great company, but only the professionals can play. You gotta have the big buildings. You gotta have tons of resources. 
Airbnb provides a framework that equips and empowers anyone with the desire to be in the hotel business to be in the hotel business. What we see in the book of Acts is that God created the church to be much more like Airbnb than like Hyatt. Unfortunately, so often, at least in our own country, we tend to try to build the church to be like the Hyatt and we lose that simple, nimble, everybody can play side of the Airbnb. What we find here in Acts 28 is that Paul is so encouraged because he knows that the movement of God's kingdom has gone beyond Paul's own efforts when he meets those brothers and sisters there in Italy. The hope of Israel, those people who know the hope of Israel have become the Israel of hope. And now in these times, when we have experienced sort of very unfamiliar hindrances in our day-to-day life, whether you know someone who is sick or you're showing symptoms yourself, or you've lost your job, or you're thinking about losing your job, or you're in a management position, you have to handle laying off people, or you're trying to navigate the government stimulus bill. There's so much uncertainty right now. And what the world needs is a whole bunch of people, brothers and sisters, able to operate, maybe not under the umbrella of some organization church name, but able to operate knowing the hope of Israel and living as the Israel, the people of hope in the world. And there's been some great stories of hope in these last two weeks, even out of our grace people. Many of you may have tracked with our daily updates. We did a flash food drive just this Thursday, and in about 24 hours, we became aware of a need for students at Minor Elementary who, since school has been canceled, still come and get their meals. There are about 1,100 students there at Minor in Lilburn, and 80% of them are on free and reduced lunch. And since this week coming up is spring break, that food service is not available. And so in conversation with the school, they said, sure, we would love to be able to distribute some non-perishable food items, maybe some grocery gift cards to the families who will come in on Friday. And so you guys responded in just this massive way. We ended up collecting 85 bags of groceries, which is amazing. You came, dropped off your stuff. We delivered those on Friday. But then in addition to that, we did 112 $20 gift cards. So you guys contributed financially. And this is a massive sign of hope for people. And every one of those bags, we just put together some encouraging scriptures of hope from Romans 15 and 1 Peter 5, just to... Let people know that our heart is for food, but really we want you to know the hope of Israel as well so that you can become the Israel of hope. Now prayer and, oh, other service. This is from Grace Village. Um, You guys know we have that incredible medical clinic down there, and so talking to our doctors, our medical providers, a lot of the immigrant and refugee community right now is sort of outside or caught in the margins, not really sure how to get medical care. And so our team down there has stripped back to medical providers only and limited the number of volunteers who can interact. But even so, we're still running that service in that community because we've got some amazing folks here who know the hope of Israel and so are living as the Israel of hope. They're living as the people of hope. Prayer has been another big part of our Journey, this is out front of Gwyn Oaks Elementary. They've taped off those blue squares or little spaces that are appropriately socially distant where people can simply come and pray for the school, pray for the community. We started our Grace Snellville Prayer Walking Club. And so in the last two weeks, look at these numbers. We've got 450 almost, 448.8 miles of prayer walking logged over 112 hours And we've done almost 31,000 feet of elevation. So Georgia is sometimes hillier than you would expect. But that's just the people who've logged it. I know across our whole community, you guys have been walking and praying for your neighbors, praying for neighborhoods. And God hears that. And there's power in that. And we can't see what's going to come out of all those prayers. But this is exactly where we need to be. And so... We're making a shift. We talked at the beginning of this whole season 
about how we really wanted to take these couple of weeks, the beginning of the restricted movement, to really get into an adjustment phase, get used to life with our kids at home, working from home, downloading the Zoom app, working out our rhythms as a church. Uh, but then we're going to begin shifting because it looks like we're going to be restricted in our movements for a little while. And so we're going to shift from that adjustment phase toward an investment phase. We're really looking to develop and grow ourselves and to serve in our communities with that kind of cause-oriented stuff. And so this Thursday, as long as it all works out, and we'll keep you updated through our communications, we're going to be hosting a great guy, one of our, one of our grace guys, Hank Reed, is going to be hosting a free drive through of meals to distribute to folks in need. That's going to be starting at 4.30 right here in our parking lot. And, and, and Hank's been running his nonprofit called Let Them Eat to help serve the community. It's a great partnership that we're able to put together with him. And then we also recognize there are going to be a lot of needs in our own congregation, within our own Grace Snellville, Grace family. And so our team has put together a very helpful assistance exchange. So if you go to my Snellville and you log in, mysnellville.gfc.tv, you'll see up at the top there, there is a little place that we've added to the interface that says assistance exchange. And if you go there and click there, you can enter a need, you can offer help, you can see the offers of help, and you'll be able to see the list of needs. And if you need financial resources, there are links for all of those things. And so if you click through and see the list of needs, you'll see something like this. It'll show the details of the various needs, what kind of category it is. Maybe you need help driving. Maybe it's caring for a senior adult. It shows the area, the time of that availability. We've had a lot of people ask, what can we do? How can we serve? We want to engage and be helpful. And so with these new restrictions, the most recent Friday announcement of stay at home from Gwinnett County, it's quite possible that some of these needs will be limited as we try to respect the restrictions that the government is giving us for the sake of this pandemic being limited, but nonetheless, we're really trying to equip our people here at Grace to be able to interact. And so if there are people who say, hey, I can help in this way, I'll, I would love to run to the grocery store and, and get food for somebody, or, or I'd love to send out some cards or make some calls or check in on some people, you can submit that as well. So that's going live uh, today on our mysnellville.gfc website. You can also get there from the regular Snellville website. But we would love to see just this sort of organic interaction of our people being the brothers and sisters who know the hope of Israel and are living as the Israel of hope. And then once spring break week ends, we're going to begin offering some webinars, do some other training and so forth. So uh, we're, we're with you. We're living this too. We don't know what every Sunday is going to be like. We're going to worship. We're going to read the word. We're going to trust God to work wonders. But we're with you in this. And the book of Acts, as we said, it ends on a rather uncertain sort of narrative level. The story doesn't conclude, but the truth of God remains strong. And Paul's there, he's under house arrest, but he's continuing to proclaim the unhindered kingdom. Let's pray together. Uh, Lord, as we've these last three weeks read through the final two chapters of the book of Acts, we've seen Paul as the hub of an unexpected community in crisis. We've seen Paul display uncommon call, calm, and, and we've seen Paul really have confidence in you and in your unhindered kingdom. And Lord, in spite of all the unknowns, we ask that you would transform us, transfigure us, renew our minds as we were praying with Aaron at the beginning of the gathering, that we too might become anchors of unexpected community because we have the word of the Lord. We too would be people of uncommon calm even in the face of anxiety 
And Lord, would we be people of the unhindered kingdom? Would you show each of us simple ways, whether it's praying for our neighbors, serving, offering encouraging word, whatever the case may be, Lord, we ask that you would let us be the people of hope. In the name of Jesus, amen. As we enter into this last moment of worship, I just invite you to read these lyrics, confess them as a prayer, as a declaration, that we are living in an unhindered kingdom because the king is holding all things together. So in the midst of our uncertainty, in the midst of things that feel shaken, we trust that Jesus is holding it all together. Sing this together. In my longing, in my waiting, will your presence be enough? When I'm fearful, when I'm doubting, will I have the strength to trust? You're the last, you're forever You're the one who brings spring out of winter You're the promise and you are the keeper You're the one who holds all things together In my grieving In my sorrow Will your goodness steady me when I'm blinded, when I'm hopeless? Will I have the eyes to see? You're the first, you're the last, you're forever. You're the one who brings spring out of wind.
Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing Great are you, Lord All the earth will shout your praise Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing week whenever it seems like the next news story is too great to remember that simple refrain that we're singing, a great are you Lord. I hope that it just echoes and resonates in your soul as the hope of Israel, Jesus, gives you life. We invite you to join us in the Zoom communities or in your homes to participate in the family talk discussions right now, and we'll be back with you, Zoom communities, this Tuesday and Thursday at noon and 8 p.m. Thursday afternoon, we're giving away free meals for people in need. We'll be sending out the daily updates as well, but before we sign off for now, I invite you just to hold your hands open for a benediction. And so now, may you discover and deepen unexpected community. May you live and love with uncommon calm. And may you with all boldness join in the work of the unhindered kingdom of our Lord. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, peace be with you all. Amen.